and I'm very pleased to be here today, especially this year, because 2011 is very special. It's 20 years ago we witnessed dramatic events in Lithuania and the other Baltic countries. 20 years ago, the courage and determination of the people in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia led to the regaining of freedom after almost 50 years of Soviet occupation. It's one thing to gain independence, but it's an even bigger challenge to gain freedom built on democratic institutions and values. And throughout history, we have seen many dreams of freedom crushed. We have seen conflicts and tensions erode good intentions and pave the way for new oppression and human suffering. And people are still struggling for democracy and human rights in our very neighborhood in Belarus. But not here in the Baltic region, you managed to gain both freedom and independence. Not immediately, but through a long and focused struggle to achieve the goals that you had set. And the development we have seen in the Baltic region over the last 20 years is, of course, of historic dimensions. Democracy, the rule of law, and a market economy are now the pillars of these dynamic countries, countries that have also become members of both the European Na uh, Union and NATO. The Baltic countries have returned to Europe, and Europe have returned to the Baltic countries. So looking back 20 years ago, um, Swedish sympathies with the Baltic independence movement were strong. And this solidarity was manifested in many different ways. One example uh, was the weekly public Monday meetings on Norman's Tory in Stockholm, which became a tradition. And I, myself, as a youth representative, uh, were present there at many of these meetings. Turning to the present, uh, we are glad that there is no longer a need for those meetings. Nonetheless, we look forward to calling one more. This will take place in August of this year as a part of the events that Sweden will arrange to highlight and commemorate the fact that 20 years have passed, 20 years since restoration of independence and of diplomatic relations. With the process that led up to uh, the restoration of independence in the Baltic countries in a way, Sweden also rediscovered some of its own history. The bonds between our countries go back a long way. And history once again came full circle uh, as the Baltic Sea regained its rule as a, a unifier rather than a divider between East and West. As it had done previously in history, the Baltic Sea again opened the door to trade, investments and exchanges. And this has led to increased growth, employment and development. Today, the economies in the Baltic Sea region are closely in interlinked as in fact all the economies could be said inside the European Union. And Sweden is today the biggest investor in Lithuania, and 60% of Swedish exports go in fact to EU countries. We have been, become closely interlinked and we depend on each other. And as a matter of fact, this is the case in a broader perspective too. In our globalized world, decisions in other parts of the world will affect us, and often in a way that is hard to foresee. We also live in a world where information, knowledge, money, and also people move, interact, and cross borders in a way we have never seen before in history. When things are going well, this globalized world gives us more dynamic, developed, and exciting societies. At other times, we end up with problems that our old nation states cannot tackle on their own. In many respects, the financial crisis is an example of this. The storm that was created in the name of speculation, dragged the whole world uh, into the worst crisis we have seen since the Great Depression of the 1930s. It set the global economy rocking and brought whole countries to the point of collapse. Um, it hit international banks in New York, but also small companies and shops on our local streets. It affected both Lithuania and also Sweden. 50% of Sweden's GDP comes from exports. Our economy is strongly linked to the rest of the world, with less demand for Swedish goods and services and growing unemployment. It meant that we had to worry about macroeconomic stability, jobs and household finances. 
And yet today, we can see that Sweden was able to tackle the crisis better than many other countries. In fact, we managed to steer our course through the storm better than we had in the past. Now we are seeing a rapid fall in unemployment and our public, uh, public finances are practically in a surplus. Growth is high and in several international surveys, um, measuring growth potential, competitiveness, future possibility, Sweden ranks highly. And today I will try to explain the reasons for this and I would like to try uh, to draw some conclusions from the Swedish crisis management and describe what I see as a fundamental point uh, for sustainable growth and economic development. But let me first state that the global financial situation still needs our attention and that the current situation of small open economies like Sweden and Lithuania can change dramatically in just a few months if we are not careful. We must also remember that the European economy, regardless of the financial crisis, is suffering from weak growth and low productivity, as well as high structural unemployment. It suffers from inadequate labor market flexibility, and a large part of the workforce is either outside of the labor market or has outdated skills, or if worse, both. Against this backdrop, the message last year from the reflection group of the future of, of the EU, which was led by the former Spanish Prime Minister Filippo González, did not come as a surprise. The choice for the EU is clear, it said, reform or decline, and time is actually running out. The group also pointed out a number of areas where urgent action is needed, and I would like to highlight two, uh, two of these. Renew and, uh, renewing Europe's economic and social model and uh, investing in education, research and innovation. Today I would uh, also like to give a Swedish perspective on these challenges. Talking about Swedish experience, uh, this is uh, the result of reforms carried out in the 1990s and in the recent years. And I believe that as a consequence of these reforms, a new image of Sweden is beginning to emerge. We are moving away from being a high-tax society to a society that encourages work and entrepreneurship. Step by step, we are strengthening individual freedom and the freedom of choice. We have high economic growth and high ambitions in areas of welfare, employment, knowledge, innovation and environmental thinking. One major reason for our strong position today is what we learned uh, our lessons back in the 1990s. Between 1990 and 1993, Sweden was hit hard by a deep recession. GDP fell for three years in a row. Employment fell and unemployment climbed to 8%. Public finances suffered severely with deficits of around 10% for several years and the debt grew from around 45% of GDP to nearly 80%. The recession was a res uh, result of prolonged mismanagement. During what could be described as Sweden's mad quarter of a century, incentives to work were undermined by a sharp rise in taxes and a major expansion of subsidies and social benefits. Combined with factors such as a failing education system, this led to falling un uh, employment and rising social exclusion. Sweden also tried to cope with the increased international competition through subsidies, instant devaluations and a loose grip on inflation. And these policies had only one long-term result. They undermined public finances and made our economy extremely vulnerable. And in the early 1990s, we stood face to face with the consequences. It was a tough time an extremely severe situation for Sweden, but one which forced us to introduce a number of long-term reforms. The budget process in Parliament was reformed, clear targets were introduced for inflation and public finances, the Riksbank, the Swedish central bank, was guaranteed independence, which helped to strengthen monetary policy. The pension system was reformed and a tax reform implemented that amended the worst aspects of the Swedish tax systems. And among other things, the electoral period was extended from three to four years and, a Sw and Sweden became a member of the European Union. In the early 1990s, the government also implemented a privatization program and deregulated important markets in Sweden. 
All of these reforms went a long way towards extricating us from the situation back then. But learning lessons from the 1990s simply was not and is not enough. It does not fully explain Sweden's current situation. It does not explain why we have been successful in managing the crisis this time around. As I mentioned earlier, Sweden had, a long, had long had a growing problem of social exclusion. This was not visible in the official unemployment figure, but if you added up the people on sick leave in early retirement or on other social benefits, it meant that one in five Swedes of working age was outside the labor market. One in five Swedes of working age. That's over a million people. Outside the labor market, living on social benefits. That was the situation when my gov government came into office in 2006. I believe that if you want to solve a problem, then you need to go to its roots. Cosmetic surgery will not do. And faced with social exclusion and falling employment, you must be prepared to take a long-term perspective. This was why we introduced the work first principle. To put it more precisely, we want everyone to be able to find a job that matches their own capacity to work. It must be more worthwhile to work. It must be easier and cheaper to employ people. And more companies must start up, stay and grow in Sweden. This, in short, is what the work first principle is all about. Accordingly, step by step, we have lowered income tax by implementing an in-work tax credit for low and medium earners. So far, this has meant, uh, for example, that an assistant nurse has received tax credits worth one month's extra wages every year. In 2011, total income tax reductions will amount to 2% of GDP. We have also introduced better conditions for running a business and employing people taking our starting point in the value of free enterprise, uh, enterprise and entrepreneurship. We have encouraged employers to hire people with little or no connection to the labor market through special tax deductions. We have cut red tape and encouraged entrepreneurship in the welfare sector. And perhaps most importantly, we have reformed the unemployment insurance and sickness insurance systems implementing more stringent requirements, adjusting benefit levels, and introducing clearer targets, moving away from passivity towards a greater focus on coaching, work placement schemes, and employment training. Thanks in large part to the Work First principle, we have managed to lay a solid foundation. As a consequence, we meet the current downturn with a historically high level of employment, with the number of people on sick leave halved and the number of people in early retirement decreasing for the first time in Sweden now for 35 years. We had, many, uh, we had more hours worked in the economy and lower unemployment, higher tax revenues and less pressure on social welfare programs. And despite the crisis, we stuck to our first uh, work first principle. On the whole, our crisis management did not involve new policies, but rather strengthening what we considered to be good policies for Sweden, both in short and long term. The results? Employment today is higher than it was before the financial crisis, and unemployment in Sweden is falling at the second fastest rate inside the European Union. Before moving on, I would like to mention another important aspect of Swedish society linked to work and growth, namely the issue of gender equality. Sweden has the major advantage of being a gender equal society. Good childcare provision and preschools have enabled women and men to participate in the labor market on more equal terms. This creates not only greater personal freedom, but also a higher level of growth and development. Of course, more needs to be done, and more will be done to give women and, me and men equal opportunities on the labor market. And more also needs to be done in other European countries, otherwise we will not achieve our growth potential. We must face the facts. Today, the employment rate among women in the EU is 51.7%. Among men, it is 63.9%. If employment among women and men in the EU was the same, then the potential increase in growth 
would be estimated at between 25 to 30 percent. So it's obvious. We cannot discuss a long-term sustainable growth while ignoring the issue of gender equality. Long-term reforms to battle social exclusion, the work first principle and active measures on the labor market, they are all crucial. Crucial to tackling a crisis and crucial to building social and financial sustainability. However, they will quickly diminish in importance if public finances are not in order. And this brings me to perhaps the most crucial message. You know, I've learned many things from crisis management in recent years, and one of those is how society reacts in times of crisis. From companies to unions, interest groups to media, and not forgetting, of course, the opposition. They say, freeze. Freeze society. Freeze all the companies, all the workplaces, and save all the jobs the way they are today. Spend taxpayers' money on subsidies that makes it possible for things to stay the way they are. Pay for, uh, pay for our costs, pay for our losses, pay for our wages, do this and spend what you have. That is what they say. To listen to these voices is a surefire way of ruining public finances. And it's a surefire way of not dealing with the actual problems. I consider sound public finances a fundamental must for long-term sustainable economic policy. This principle must be honored in good as well in bad times. And there are many reasons why. A fiscal policy that is not sustainable in the long term leads to debts that threaten growth, welfare and employment. A fiscal policy that is not sustainable in the long term affects the whole of society. But the hardest hit are those that are most in need of security and welfare in order for their daily lives to function. This is always the case. And it is even more so for a small and open economy. Sweden and Lithuania cannot be compared with the United States. We cannot rely on our size to help us cope with financial instability, deficits or public debts. If we ignore these facts, we will be quickly punished by the financial markets and we will be punished hard. We need to keep our public finances stable and in good order. And if successful, we will not only be able to cope with crisis and afford reforms, we will also be an attractive country to invest in and to do business with. This was why we clearly stated right back in 2006 that we would make sound public finances and sustainable economic policy one of our main priorities. Consequently, we maintained a surplus in public finances during the good times and we set about paying off public debt. By doing so, we prepared Sweden for a rainy day and we began preparing Sweden for long-term challenges such as an aging population and were able to make investments for the future. When hit by the financial crisis, this po uh, policy of responsibility put us in a much stronger position, perhaps a stronger position than ever before. And all through the crisis, we stuck to the policy, saying if the crisis was created by people borrowing too much, the solution cannot be for governments to act in the same way. We did not listen to the loud crisis for cry outs for public spending. We supported people through active measures rather than supporting industries through subsidies or banks and financial institutions through funding without setting clear conditions. We did not accept protectionism or spend taxpayers' money to save companies that were not competitive. We said, when the ship is sinking, our main priority should be to save the sailors, not the ship. As a result, Sweden's public debt was lower at the end of last year than it was back in 2006, down from 45% of GDP to around 39%. I still consider this to be one of our most crucial decisions in managing the crisis. If we had abandoned this responsible approach, we would have ended up in a totally different situation. While tackling the financial crisis, we have also combined measures that are necessary in the short term with the continuous reforms needed for the future. This is particularly true of education, research and development. This year, we will have a new grading system in place. We're introducing a clearer 
knowledge-oriented school curriculum and uh, a new preschool curriculum with greater educational content. To provide support to help teachers do their jobs well, a teacher's package is being implemented with a boost for teachers, stronger educational leadership, further education for teachers and research schools. There will be more teaching hours in schools and stronger focus on maths, technology and science. We are also making important investments in research and development. Public and private investments in Sweden now amount to almost 4% of GDP, which according to the OECD statistics is second only to Israel. This has also put Sweden at the top of the European Commission's scoreboard for innovation. I would like to add one final point. The need to stick to a long-term reform program. The need for constant and continuous reform. I say this because there are no shortcuts of quick fixes to coping with the world of today. Rather, there is an ongoing need to reform, adapt and develop in order to become more competitive and thereby lay the foundation for new jobs, new enterprises so as to finance our future welfare. Despite the crisis, we stuck, we stuck to our long-term reform program. The major elements of our crisis management was not, were not a matter of new policies. They were a question uh, of strengthening what we considered to be good policies. I believe that given the right tools, every individual has in them to make a difference, and that politics should be used to create the conditions needed to make this possible. This is one of the core values of our policy for sustainable growth. Seen from this point of view, encouraging work, entrepreneurship and new jobs gives people the chance to build a better life for themselves through their own efforts. And in the process, they contribute not only to their own well-being, but to the growth and development of society as a whole. Ensuring sound public finances and reducing public debt, meanwhile, enables you to stay in, stand on safe ground. No matter whether you are facing crisis or not, it allows you to make the investments in education, knowledge and research on which our future is built. It allows you to make investments in infrastructure and functioning welfare services. Let me conclude. Building a work-first principle, implementing active labour market policies, safeguarding sound public finances, sticking to necessary long-term reforms, these were the main pillars of Sweden's success in managing the current financial crisis. And I believe they are valid for all countries wanting to achieve sustainable growth, and that, that this is true for Europe as a whole. Only through reforms will the European Union be able to boost economic growth and employment, combat social exclusion and poverty, and enable people to build a better life for themselves. All of this is essential, if you want to give your children a full and good life as adults, but also if you want to ensure growth and progress. And this is what building sustainable growth is all about, pointing to a better tomorrow beyond the clouds of current crisis, creating long-term opportunities for individuals to grow, work and participate in society, and by doing so, creating the conditions for an open, dynamic and competitive society. Thank you very much.